Well, uh, I'm Pastor Joe, and you know, usually we have these great ideas in our mind, and I thought it'd be really good to have the kids go before the sermon. I think they should have gone last. And where's my friend Caroline? You can come up here and preach. Because <laughs> clearly you tell the story all the time, and what a great... When that young lady was baptized on Friday, I knew things were going to happen. And uh, I guess I, I wasn't sure it was going to be that day, but man, uh, thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, I want to I wanna pray for a minute, and uh, I want to challenge you too. The kids uh, were faithful this week. I think Kaylee said there was 173 kids that came through the doors. That's a lot of young people right there. Yeah, 173, and uh, on an average, I think we had about 150, they said, a day, and we raised, I think the total was actually over $1,300, Brenda told me. And if you'd like to help even more today with the 5 and 2 program, you can do that. So uh, you can see me after the service. If you'd like to help push that over $2,000 or $2,500 for the summer, we'd love to have your resources to make that happen, if that makes sense. But uh, God's doing something in our community, and we have just such great kids, don't we? Man, uh, you know, as, as the church, that is the church, by the way. That is the future of the church, and it's in a really good spot. I know when we listen to the news and we watch things, sometimes we're like, the sky is falling, and we feel a little bit like Chicken Little. But man, listen to those 173 kids that came through the doors whose lives have been transformed forever. And wow, the future is actually really bright because of them. So uh, let's start with prayer and then uh, we'll dive into what the Lord has for us today. Jesus, thank you for, Lord, you said let the little children come unto me. Father, may we be like, like our children today. May we be unashamed of the gospel as we heard earlier, as we tell the story of what you've done in our lives, of how you've impacted us and how your story continues to be on our lips. But Lord, whether through me or in spite of me this morning, Jesus, preach the gospel. You do us so much better, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I was sitting with... Uh, the Lord this week, and I know that, that language sometimes sounds a little bit, what exactly does he mean? I mean, envision the most holy position you can come up with and picture that. I won't tell you what really happens. <laughs> but I just had this uh, overwhelming sense as the week went on. I'm wearing my t-shirt, by the way. I don't see any other crew t-shirts out there. Are any of the other volunteers here today? I know you are, but you just weren't wearing your shirts. But I wore mine today. I had to wash it because I became an ice cream Sunday on Friday. But uh, it's I washed it, and I, and I wore it as a gentle reminder that we are all on the same team. We're all on the same crew, and uh, we're making a difference. And I, this, as I was sitting with the Lord, there was something just over and over, was that some of you today really need to be encouraged. You just need to be encouraged. We do a lot in life with uh, criticism and with corrective action and things like that. And, and make no mistake, our life with the Lord is, is about repentance and it's about walking humbly with our God. But I just had this overwhelming sense this week that you need to be encouraged. Uh, I coach girls basketball. It's, it's one of my favorite things to do. It really is. I just love uh, the young ladies and seeing them uh, just give, leave everything on the court. And I moved from playing sports to coaching sports, and it's such a, you can't do anything on the sidelines. I scream at the top of my lungs, but I can't make the ball go in the hoop. Brennan, I think I just broke your music stand. Mic stand. Uh, I'll, I won't stand on that anymore. But uh, from the sidelines, we have the ability, though, to impact the people who will make a difference. And one of the things that the, one of the boys coaches that I coached with said uh, at the end of the year at our awards banquet, he said, you know, uh, our kids shoot a lot. And they shoot a lot of threes. And he said to me early on in the season, he said, he said, Joe, these girls, these girls will be put down the rest of their life. They'll have people criticizing them. Be a champion for them. And that really resonated with me. He said, yeah, we shoot from, I mean, there was a kid in, the, in, our, in our final games who shot from like four feet inside the half court line. And he made it, by the way. But he had the green light to shoot from the coach. And I think about that in the context of life with how often we're told to stop. Well, I just want to encourage you today. I just want to be a source of encouragement for you. You know, I was digging through my mom's stuff. Does anybody 
have letter jackets still? A couple of you do. Letter jackets, yeah, like, what are letter jackets? That's probably a fair question. They're a relic. They're things that you pay for in high school that you will wear for maybe a year or two, and then they sit in the closet as a gentle reminder that we were once great. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Think about it. The further in the distance they go, the more dust that they collect, the greater you were, right? We've got, we've got articles to prove how great we were, to prove how fast we were. In fact, uh, this isn't mine. It's my daughter Taylor's. This is a first place trophy from when she played softball. And uh, I, to I asked her if I could borrow, because I needed a vision. I needed something to show you, right, about kind of sports and life, and I know you're not all sports people, but the Bible is going to give us some pretty clear instructions today in the race that we're running. And when she gave it to me, it looked just like this. I won't, I won't do anything. I'll leave it up here. You can take a peek at it afterwards. But it's got already about a quarter of an inch of dust on it. It's five years. It's, oh, it's, wow, you're getting old, Taylor. It's eight years old. Think about that. We strive to get to the finish line. A young woman yesterday uh, texted me, said, Pastor John, I'm running that half marathon tomorrow. Do you have any words of wisdom? I said, well, actually, yes, I do. Thank you for asking. And I shared with her this passage in Scripture, which is what the Lord gave me earlier in the week for you. And it comes from Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, I want to share just three brief things with you. The first is that you're not alone. Okay? So if you're taking notes today, the first thing that you might want to jot down or retain is that you are not alone. Just take a look around you right now. You're physically seeing the body of Christ, your brothers and sisters. I know that you don't know them, and right, they're like the crazy uncle that comes to the reunions. No, these are your brothers and sisters. You're not alone. The second thing I want you to kind of think through is that you gotta let go of the baggage. You gotta let go of the bag baggage. And the last thing is that you gotta keep your eye on the prize. And Hebrews tells us it this way. And the writer of Hebrews is unknown, and the church wasn't a specific church. Some have surmised that Hebrew, Hebrews was written to the church, not just a local body of people. So this letter is for you from the author, who is unknown. But we know that God divinely orchestrated it. And he said this, and he was writing, and, and as you read the book of Hebrews, you find that there are people who are kind of discouraged, and they're, they're kind of getting tempted with wandering away. And over and over and over, the writer brings us back to center. But he gives these words of encouragement towards the end of the book. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith, or the pioneer in the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Consider him. Consider Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary, and that you will not lose heart. I'm convinced more and more that God wants you to be encouraged. Encouragement goes such a long ways, right? And when we have somebody else in the journey with us, man, it's possible to do things that we can't do by ourselves. That's one of the reasons that one of the greatest weight movements in the world has been Weight Watchers. Accountability with other people, right? We're surrounded by other people. That's why in our recovery groups, they're surrounded by other people. That's why in the church you're surrounded by other people. And the writer says that there's this great cloud of witnesses. Do you see them? If you do, I want to talk to you after the service. It's not that they're not there. Elisha, in uh, 2 Kings, he was moving into... A troublesome spot with the uh, with the king of Aram, and uh, the king had actually sent out guys to kill him because he was reporting to the Israelites on where the where the Arameans were going to move and what the battle was going to look like. And the Israelites were always prepared. And the king was like, "Who's ratting us out?" And his prime guy said, "Well, it's the prophet, sir, and he's not among us." 
imagine that kind of divine knowledge. But what happens next is amazing. It says that Elisha and his, his uh, protege are there. And they've been encircled, and they're about to die, actually. It's, it's the enemies coming in, and they're going to kill these guys because, well, they're ratting them out. They're the, they're the snitches. And we all know what happens to snitches. No, they don't get stitches. What? <laughs> Elisha. Listen to what Elisha said. This is very, very important. He prayed because the servant that was with him said, Sir, we're done. It's over. And Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes. And as you read the story in 2 Kings, as you read the account of what God did to this young man's life, he says his eyes were open and he saw all of the angel armies all of a sudden. As I was praying for you this morning, I was sitting actually on that bench right there. Whoever's sitting in that bench must be anointed, I think. Nobody's sitting in it. It's because it's facing the wrong way. As I was sitting there watching the, the early fishermen take off, I was praying for you, and I prayed that your eyes would be open today. God gave us five senses to reveal himself to us, right? Sight is one of them. I prayed that your ears would be open to hear the word of God so that you would have faith. I prayed that when you shook hands with others or when you embraced in a hug, that you would feel the tenderness and the gentleness of, of God's presence. You smell that? I think God's aroma this morning smells like chicken barbecue. <laughs> right? That you would experience in all of your senses the very real presence of God. That your eyes would be open to God's presence all around us. You're not alone. You might feel like you're alone. You might think like you're, uh, you know, like in Nemo, just keep swimming one more day. Come on, just keep... There is a whole host of people who have gone before and those that are coming after. You are caught up in the marathon of God's people. And you can be encouraged by that. You can know that there are others cheering you on. One of the things that I did in high school is I ran cross country. I know a body like this was not made for cross country. But I did letter in cross country. And there were a few things that I learned along the way. One of them is you don't get out of the gate super fast. Because if you expel all your energy at the front end, you got nothing at the tail end, right? But I did learn that I was encouraged and motivated by the people next to me. They spurred me on. The author writes it this way. Spur one another on to love and good deeds, right? As you come alongside each other. Be encouraged by one another. Know that you're not alone in this. The great cloud of witnesses and those who are here with you today are part of that. Those who are not here but are sitting in the booth next to us, as we heard earlier, are part of that great cloud of witnesses. Those that can hear my voice this morning who are believers in Jesus Christ are part of that great cloud of witnesses. The second thing was really simple. It was to let go of the baggage. My buddy John, uh, he's an Ironman. Has anybody else run an Ironman triathlon? You got any other triathletes in, in the... Nobody. So maybe this one will fall flat, but we're going to try it anyways. Triathlon, they, they bike for 100 miles, right? Bob Mitten biked for a long ways too, but triathletes bike for 500 miles. They run a marathon and they swim three miles. And he did it in uh, Lake Placid. And by the way, he's a preacher. You know, preachers could do that. And I said to him, I said, John, how are you? He goes, anybody can do it. It's easy. I'm like, you are out of your mind. He said, it's really simple, buddy. Just train for it. Come on, let's do it. I'm like, no, I am not doing that. I will do a lot of things that I, the Lord would have to speak in a very loud, audible voice. But he said to me, he said, Joe, the worst thing is, the, the most difficult part for him, not for everybody, but for him, was the swimming. Because they all enter the water, and then it says, mad dash. And they don't care what happens when they enter the cold water. You can imagine, you want to be in the front of that pack, not the back. But he wears a wetsuit, because it makes him faster in the water. It doesn't, you know, his muscles are able to respond the way they're supposed to. And, and I said, well, what do you do when you get out of the water? Because I would think that would hinder you. He goes, it absolutely does. He says, so you get rid of it as quickly as you possibly can. He said, actually, what you do is you grease up parts of your body where it's prone to get stuck, like your ankles and stuff. He said, and then you just rip it right off, and then you get into the race, and you're biking next. I'm like, my goodness. The writer says it this way. He says to get rid of everything that hinders you. So church, what's hindering you today? 
What's hindering you from running the race that God has set before you? Because some of you are carrying a lot of baggage. I did a, a quick Google search this morning about the fastest marathon time. It was set just back in March by the guy who paced it in the Olympics. But it was set in March, two hours and four minutes. Or two hours and two minutes and 40 seconds. That's like a four and a half minute mile for 26.2 of them. You know what they wear? Like almost nothing. Because if he's carrying a backpack, if he's carrying all the weight of the world on his shoulders, he's not going to make it. And neither are you. Some of you feel like a dog attached to a chain, don't you? You run really hard and then you, right? You yank back. Maybe it's the challenges in life. Scripture says that we're to give those to the Lord. Everything. Maybe it actually is sin. And I love the way the Lord put it. That so easily entangles. We have animals. Quite a few of them actually. And uh, one of the things that our cats do all the time. Is they bring in those little burrs. And I can just kind of envision them stuck in the bramble and that entangles them and grabs them and they're left with stuff afterwards. That's just how sin is in our lives. It might seem subtle, right? It might seem like it's no big deal, but it slowly but surely entangles and before you know it, you can't get out. And you can't, by the way, left to your own devices. The only way out is through Jesus. And this is what the scripture says next. And this is what I want to leave you with. Listen to what Jesus did. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The pioneer or the first one in the faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I've shared with you, Pastor Thomas shared with you, the cross was a, was a horrible way to die. And it was a, it was a criminal's death, by the way. But he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. Why? So that you wouldn't have to carry that baggage any longer. So as Brennan shared, that you could have the joy today that God gives you. That you can experience it every day of your life. That there's no more days of despair. It doesn't mean we're not going to have difficult days, because you will. But it means that in the midst of the valleys... He's with us. I was uh, in sales, and they said a goal once achieved, what? No longer motivates. So set your goals high, right? Set your goals high because, you know, we got to this trophy, and then you know what happened? She doesn't play softball anymore. <laughs> She's conquered that. We live in one of the parts of the world that is most post-Christendom. Think about that for a minute. Most post-Christendom. I'll just break that down for you quickly. It means that we have done the Christianity thing and we are past that now. We have been enlightened. Buffalo, New York, number four in the country. Number four in the country. In the top 20 are four of our major cities in New York State. Right? Works right across the straight state. Buffalo, Rochester, Albany, and New York. You can almost draw a line where people have been enlightened and we've tried this. And you know what happens? Is we lose sight of who it is that we're chasing after. Because he is always in front of you, always. And he's always there cheering you on, saying, come on, come on, you can do this. Walk with me just a little bit further today. That's why over and over and over in scripture, the Lord reminds us that he's with us. So if I could encourage you today in a couple of things, it would be to look around the room or the space as it is now, right? These are your brothers and sisters in the race that God has set out for us. My other encouragement would be to help others get rid of their luggage, to let go of the things that hinder you from the faith, to share your burdens with one another. I love doing weddings. I've had the privilege of officiating at some of your weddings and some of your family members. And one of the things that I love about weddings is that in the midst of the, the marriage ceremony, one of the things I love to remind couples of is that, you know, the joys in marriage are doubled because you share them together. 
And likewise, the burdens are halved because you're both carrying the burden. That's why when Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? Take my yoke upon you. He carries that burden with us. We carry that burden with each other. We let go of the baggage and others help us carry it and we can, we can leave it at the cross. <laughs> but finally, don't get so far ahead of yourselves that you lose sight of who it is that you're chasing after. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I read a devotional this morning and I'll leave you with this thought. And uh, the author, he opens his devotionals with this. He says, the, the spirit of Jesus in me greets the spirit of Jesus in you. But he was talking about that you were made for one purpose. One. It's not to work a job, you know, until the end of the race. A colleague of mine just passed away. <laughs> Retired a year ago and died today. Died this weekend. We run this race not to work just one job, it's not to marry the perfect spouse, it's not to raise the perfect family, it's not to do all the best things that you can possibly do, it's not to see the seven wonders of the world. One purpose is to worship the Lord God Almighty and to enjoy His company forever. So church, I want to encourage you today to let go of everything else. Pursue Jesus today. Let the joy of the Lord fill you to overflowing. You know, I want to be the recipient of, of someone else's joy. I want to be the, the guy that's sitting there, the other saying, man, I got I had such a great day, you're not going to believe it. I met Jesus again today. So I can say, oh, me too, buddy. Where are you at? If you need some help letting go of things, your church wants to walk alongside you. And that's not the paid staff. That's the unpaid staff. That's your brothers and sisters right next to you right now. We want to help you carry those burdens and let go of them. We want to encourage you so that you can continue on in the faith. So that you don't grow weary in well-doing, right? But that you see the finished product. Paul said it this way, and I'll leave you with these final words. He said, not that I have already obtained, but I press on towards the prize which the Lord, the righteous judge, will appoint to me and to everyone who believes. Those in Christ will receive their trophy. It won't look like this, by the way. And you'll hear the same words that all of the other saints who have gone before and all the saints who will follow will hear. You'll hear, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Church, the Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. I love you. We love you. You're not alone. Be encouraged today to take one more step in faith. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us today at, at the waterfront, at the sacred ground in Bemis Point. God, thank you that you haven't left us alone, but that you've been working on our lives even before today. God, thank you that even though we may not see you with our eyes, that there is this great cloud of witnesses, that the saints are all around us, that you, Jesus, are with us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us such faith that we let go of the things, the thoughts, the tangible things that are hindering us from walking in faith with you. Give us the victory, Lord, today over sin and over death. Father, keep our eyes fixed firmly upon you. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.